My subject tonight was picked for me again, and I'm going to try to do justice to it. I'm going to make a confession. I did not send Dr. Christio the title of a single lecture. He merely put the lectures, titles down on the program and told me, these are the subjects you're going to talk about. And I didn't have time to prepare a single lecture. But the lecture that I've delivered here so far in this convention and this one tonight have been delivered as I go along in the talk. And I hope I'm going to be able to do justice to the right subject under the same circumstance. I did reach over and get those excerpts from my book that he just told you about to see just what it was that I had written that contained so much. In two pages, I have the solution of all the problems of the earth. If I really have, then I'm a super genius such as the world never dreamed of. I'll tell you tonight how to reinvigorate that body of yours It's not a problem that is simple enough that I could condense it into two pages, much less cover all the solutions of all the other problems of Earth. By the way, while I'm talking about that, the book in which all this wisdom is contained is out of print. That's the reason he said you would have to dig for it. But a revised edition is on the press, and I expect it from the press about the end of the summer. Watch for it for the announcement of it in the magazine, those of you who want it. It deals with the subject of exercise. Orthokinesiology simply means, when translated into simple English, the science of correct motion. We like to put them in these $15 words so that it sounds like we know something. You can take the worst type of ignorance and dress it up in a Latin or a Greek terminology and make it look like knowledge. We do that because we get more money for it that way. By like going into a physician with a pain in the knee and telling him all about the pain, he can't see it, he can't feel it, there's no way for him to determine that you have a pain in the knee unless you tell him. So after you describe your pains and tell him the full details, he ends up by telling you that you have arthralgia. It's exactly what you told him. Only he put it in Greek, and he gets five dollars for translating into Greek what you told him in English. You go into an oculist or an optometrist and you just he explained to him that you have to get your book right up close to read, and you get it off out there, everything is blurred. And he goes through a series of processes that he calls eye examination, and he ends up by telling you that you've got myopia. That's what you told him. When you went in, you told him that you were short-sighted. And when he got through, he gave you a diagnosis of myopia, which is another Greek word, which means short-sightedness. Five dollars for the translation. Now, in any city of any size, you can get professional translators that will translate whole books for you for less money. I mean less than five dollars a word. It always reminds me, the priest craft and the preacher craft and the medical craft and the other craft, even the legal craft, I like to dress up everything in these verbose and terminologies that people don't understand, so Martin Luther fell out with the church over a doctrine that they call transubstantiation. Now, nobody knows what it means, nobody knows what it can possibly be, but they have the word and it sounds like knowledge. Transubstantiation. So he substituted the word consubstantiation for a slightly different variation of the doctrine, and everybody knows what that means. We do it in religion as well as in medicine. We do it in everything. We try to cover up our ignorance by these terms that nobody understands. But now that has nothing to do with you gaining or reinvigorating your body. I merely wanted to tell you or explain to you how you're being hoodwinked by fancy terms. 
Now you were paying out your money for nothing. Human vigor depends upon certain basic conditions of life. These conditions are primordial requisites of life itself. And without these, without a due supply of these primordial requisites of life, there can be no high degree of vigor. And vigor must wane or fade and finally cease altogether as one or the other of these primordial requisites of life are withheld, either partially or wholly, from the life of the individual. These requisites, these necessities, these basic necessities of life without which life itself cannot go on, are the simple everyday materials and influences that enable us to live. Or to put it a little differently, they're the, those same materials and influences that old Mother Nature has employed throughout all past time that she employs now and will continue to employ throughout all time to come to build and to maintain both the vegetable and the animal kingdoms. Now, I, I am sure that every one of you know what these things are. One of them, of course, is the salt vaccine. Penicillin is another one. Streptomycin is another one. Aspirin and Alka-Seltzer. Without these, of course, you cannot possibly live. You could not have grown from infancy to maturity had you not been nourished and sustained, had your tissues not been built out of these primordial requisites of life. Or have I made some kind of a mistake? Is it food and air and water and sunshine and rest and sleep? Are these the requisites of life? Are these the materials and influences with which tissues are built, organs are constructed, organisms are made and sustained? Are these not really the primordial requisites of life, whether we deal with the single-celled amoeba or the multi-celled man, whether we deal with the plant or with the animal, not poison, but food, not vaccines and serums, but air and water, not surgical operations, but sunshine. These are the basic essential factor elements out of which living structures are composed and by which living structures are repaired and maintained. These are the materials by which we grow and by which we function. And it is upon these, not upon stimulants, not upon tonics, but upon these that we must depend as the basic and necessary conditions for the production and continuance of vigor. Deny proper food, fed as we are upon a diet that is predominantly denatured, fed upon a diet that is made up largely of food that have been spoiled by the cook, filling our bodies with fluid that are, that are guaranteed to give us a lift, fluid that contain poisonous substances, fluid that contain useless substances, rather than filling, taking pure water, drinking your chlorine cocktails, that your cities supply you with, filling up 
with tea and coffee and alcohol, smoking. Of course, nowadays, when you want to smoke, you get a king-size filter-tip cigarette. And these, believe it or not, give off a very pleasing aroma. And they're very tasty. At least that is what the lies say that come to us over the radio and over television to induce us. Not you people. No, you're too old. Television and radio programs are not keyed to the adult mind, but to the child mind. These things come into your homes to persuade your children to become dope addicts in order that they may be invigorated by the use of these. What I want to point out with reference to these particular types of substances is that while they appear to improve your vigor, to increase your strength, actually they decrease it. We are conscious of our strength only in its expenditure. I'm not sure who is the world's champion bruiser at the present time. It may be Rocky Marciano. I don't know why these Italians all like that word Rocky. Every Italian prize fighter is a rock. They love it. But anyhow, let us put it this way. Rocky Marciano asleep is not conscious of his vigor, of his energy, of his power. We are conscious of energy only in its expenditure. But it is the expenditure of energy that reduces our energy. Take a stimulant and force the expenditure of energy and we become conscious of it. We think that we are stronger, we have more vigor, when actually we're getting rid of our vigor. And this is the reason that the inevitable reaction following the taking of any stimulant is one of depression, one of weakness. So that every day or every minute that we indulge in these various poison habits, these stimulant habits, these things that are said to give us a lift, reduces our energy. So that not only must we supply the body with the requisite essentials of life, but we must avoid those things that needlessly waste or dissipate our energy. And we dissipate energy in many ways. We dissipate energy not merely through our poison habits, we dissipate it with emotional habits, worry, fear, anxiety. Emotions are not merely mental phenomena, they are physical as well. There are physical activities, glandular, nervous, muscular. Every emotion constitutes a a rapid expenditure of energy. The so-called destructive emotions create and maintain a state of tension. The so-called constructive emotions are states of relaxation. So that one of them, happiness, joy, peace, love, these conserve our energy. The others waste them. We waste our energies in our excessive indulgence. We waste them in overwork. There are very few people who overwork anymore. We used to have a saying in politics, we used to talk about the workers and the owners of the earth. And there was always a conflict between the owners and the workers. Now we haven't any workers left anymore, and the conflict is between the owners and the shirkers. Today, when we go on the job, we put in usually about eight hours. But we do about two hours' work. It's rare that we see anybody suffering from overwork. I can't say that about those of you who are here at this convention. Somebody said they ought to last two weeks. You'd all be dead by that time. We keep you up here night after night. And a loss of sleep takes from your energy. It reduces your vigor. Because it is during rest and sleep that you recuperate energy. 
And when you do not get adequate rest and sleep to enable you to recuperate from your day's activities, you start the next day with a little less energy. And as that process continues, you start it day by day with less and less until finally you become so profoundly enervated that the undertaker takes charge. That is all death is. If somebody shoots you in the brain, you die because the sudden shock deprives you of all of your energy. You die of shock. You die of exhaustion. Poisoning is death from exhaustion. All death comes from exhaustion. That is the reason all death is suicide. I told you last night, or the night before, that even soldiers who, are, who permit themselves to be drafted and then get shot actually are suicide. All of mankind all down the ages has been dying of, because he's been killing himself one way or another. And we kill ourselves by exhausting the energy with which we live. Now how? After we have dissipated our energy, how are we to reinvigorate our body? How are we to restore energy once we have brought ourselves to a low state? of vitality or of nervous energy, only by supplying the conditions that are requisite to the restoration of that energy, not by forcing the expenditure of the little that we have left, not by taking tonics, not by resort to stimulants, not by stuffing ourselves with the thought that we need plenty of good nourishing food to keep up our strength. This world is full of people that are dying from taking so much good nourishing food that they die of excess drink. More people die from gluttony than from starvation in all periods of the world's history and in all parts of the world. We cannot restore our energies by indulging in exercise if we're going to overdo the exercise. There is a time in life when we need to cease all activity and rest, not merely for a day or for a night, but for a period of time sufficiently long to enable us to recuperate from a state of profound enervation that is the result of years of excessive expenditure. All of mankind all down the ages has been dying of, because he's been killing himself one way or another. And we kill ourselves by exhausting the energy with which we live. Now how? After we have dissipated our energy, how are we to reinvigorate our bodies? How are we to restore energy once we have brought ourselves to a low state of vitality or of nervous energy, only by supplying the conditions that are requisite to the restoration of that energy, not by forcing the expenditure of the little that we have left, not by taking tonics, not by resort to stimulants, not by stuffing ourselves with the thought that we need plenty of good nourishing food to keep up our strength. This world is full of people that are dying from taking so much good nourishing food that they die of excess strength. More people die from gluttony than from starvation in all periods of the world's history and in all parts of the world. We cannot restore our energies by indulging in exercise if we're going to overdo the exercise. There is a time in life when we need to cease all activity and rest, not merely for a day or for a night, but for a period of time sufficiently long to enable us to recuperate from a state of profound enervation that is the result of years of excessive expenditure. You spend 25, 30, or 40 years excessively expending the energies of your body 
and bring yourself to the brink of the grave and then you expect to be reinvigorated in a day or two. And they have milks, powdered milks and powdered yeast or dried yeast and various other substances that they tell you will do that for you. They'll do nothing of the kind. There is but one way that is provided by old Mother Nature for recuperation of energy. And that is the opposite to the means employed to waste or dissipate that energy. The one is stimulation and excitement or work. The other is rest, sleep, relaxation. Rest and sleep are nature's grand representative restorative processes. Stimulation, work, and excitement are her representative processes of expenditure. If you're weak, it is not stimulants and tonics that you require. It is not a great burden of food that you must take into your digestive system, but rest that you need. It has been estimated, and I don't know how accurate the estimate is, that it takes as much energy to digest and carrying through the 28 feet of digestive tubing and handle three square meals a day as it does to perform eight hours of hard physical labor. Imagine taking a weak man and stuffing him and stuffing him with the idea that you're going to build up his strength by feeding him plenty of good nourishing food when it's using up that much energy to handle all that food even though he does not, does not digest it, but passes it out through the cold. Many of us have here truly imagine that the way to properly live is to be always filling up and emptying out again anyhow. We confer, convert ourselves into fertilizer factories to get strong. I have people writing me and say, I don't think I could undergo a fast. I am so weak and I am so thin but they're home glutting themselves and growing thinner and weaker. And they're taking vitamins and tonics to get strong on, but they still grow weaker. You have to get weak in order to get strong. You've got to rest. You've got to sleep. You've got to relax. The most potent source of weakness is a toxic state of the body, a condition that results from checked elimination. Now that doesn't mean bowel action or bowel movement or a, or a checking of bowel movement. Bowel movement is not and never was elimination. Checked elimination means a checking or an impairing of the processes by which waste matter is removed from the bloodstream. And when that is checked as a consequence of innervation, the normal waste products of life, products that are given off by every cell in the body, every minute of existence, accumulate in the bloodstream, producing a toxemic condition, and it makes one weak. One of the most important means of reinvigorating the body is to eliminate this toxic load that it carries, consequent upon the innervation which results from overwork, from stimulation, from excesses, from emotional irritations, and from the lack, such as lack of sleep, lack of sunshine, and so forth, from the sins of omission as well as the sins of commission. These produce weakness. In order to go right up. Necessary first, then, that we cease all of those practices, all of those indulgences, all of those habits that are excessively expending the energies of life. It is necessary that we rest in order to recuperate our dissipated energy. It is necessary that we free our bodies of its toxic load. And finally, it is necessary that we supply the body with the normal and natural requisites of life. If we do this, we 
we're not going to jump out here and start bouncing around and lifting heavy weights and running long distances or doing heavy work the next day. It takes a long time for a normal, healthy individual to break himself down by his bad habits. It takes weeks. It takes months. It takes years in some cases. The reverse process, that of restoring normal condition, normal energy and vigor to the body, is also an evolutionary process. It's going to take weeks, months, years. I tell everybody that comes to my place for care, they want to know how long is it going to take me to get well? I say not less than two years and probably more. Now that doesn't mean that they're going to stay at my place two years. They may stay three weeks or four weeks or two months or something of that kind. They get a start. Some of them get such a good start that they think they're all, well, I'm well now. I can go back and do the things that hurt me. Actually, they have just gotten a good start on the road to help. And it takes a, a considerable period of time thereafter for them to reach full health. So let us not be discouraged if we do not rapidly or instantaneously progress from a state of semi invalidism to one of athletic superiority. Be patient and take time. Get on the right track and stay there and do not let anybody shunt you off into another track that will lead you ultimately into a blind alley. I remember once caring for an old man who suffered from various troubles down in the city of San Antonio. This was back in 1923. I made him undergo a considerable period of rest on a house cleaning, and he was doing splendidly. But then I left San Antonio, and I gave him instructions to carry out, and I said, beyond all things else, don't put yourself under the hands of these boys who want to stimulate you and whip you up and make things appear to be what they're not. Stimulating the, the invalid is like putting rouge on your cheeks and lipstick on your lips. You're imitating or trying to imitate the real article. You're cheating yourself by such methods. I got a letter from him a few months later telling me that he had found a man that was going to cure him. He was doing so splendidly under this man's care. The man was giving him electrical treatments. And I wrote back to him and I said, the period of time that you have been resting meant something. You have recuperated sufficient energy that you've got some now to be stimulated away. And the, stimula the electrical stimulation makes you think that you have increased vigor. You just have to keep up this treatment for a little while and you will discover your mistake. It was not more than a month to six weeks later that I received a letter from him saying that he was sorry that he had undergone the electrical treatment, that he found that he was worse than ever. Don't let yourself be shunted aside into these plausible, by the plausible arguments that are offered for the use of these things. Not one of them has any value. All of them, whether they call them drugless medicine or drug medicine, and with all due respect to Dr. Gaiman, I have no intentions of pussyfooting on that medical issue. I do have criticisms of physicians, and I intend to continue making them. I have criticisms of the men and of their methods, as well as of their crazy theory. I think they're the smoothest and best organized bunch of them rascals and cutthroats that ever swashbuckled on land or sea. I think that they're directly responsible for at least 90% of the deaths that occur in this country every year. They're back of every move to force vaccines and serums of any kind upon you. There are 13 states in this nation that compel you to have your child vaccinated before it can enter school. 13. And yet in every one of the states where there is no law, 
requiring vaccination to enter school, the school doctors and the school nurses, I should have said school physician rather than doctor, try to coerce parents into having their children vaccinated, and not merely against smallpox, but against diphtheria and against measles, scarlet fever, and other troubles. I wouldn't belong to a profession that has to use the police force and the army and navy to coerce people into their offices. I don't like them. I don't like what they do. I don't like what they stand for. I know they don't like me either, so it's mutual. Stay away from these things and stay away from the massages and the manipulations and the adjustments and the ultrasonic and the electrical treatments and all of the other kinds of treatments that are employed by the very various disease trades that are said to reinvigorate you, to accelerate activity, to stimulate you. You better run. If you want to really reinvigorate that body of yours, every resort to them means less energy, less vitality, less vigor, less of that precious energy of life that enables you to go on, whether in a state of good health or in the low state of health that you now find yourself. Thank you. Dr. Shelf, is there any factual data, x-ray or otherwise, which proves that calcium deposits in human tissue can be removed through the fasting process? Dr. Shelf. I do not know of any myself, any x-ray exhibits of that type. If we take the patient, however, that has a joint, let's say the spinal column, that is stiff as a poker, and the x-ray shows definite calcium deposits. And we place the patient from the past, and the spinal column becomes flexible and usable. The veins that are associated with it disappear, and the spinal column remains flexible and usable. I think we are justified in assuming, even in the absence of the x-ray picture, that the calcium deposit is no longer there. In cases of the large joint, or particularly, let us say, of the knee in arthritis, you take a patient that's got a lot of calcium deposits in that knee and put them on a prolonged fast, and it, in many cases we can take that knee after a time and crush it in our hands and actually crush that shell in there like an eggshell and break it down. So much of the, of the calcium has been absorbed in the meantime uh, that we just have the shell left. Okay. Uh, Assumption that they are some vegetarians live longer than uh, meat eaters. Some meat eaters live longer than vegetarians. Uh, the advantage in the vegetarian life, I think, the fundamental advantage in the vegetarian life is not all from the health standpoint, but in the belief, in the realization that you are able to live without taking life. The vegetarian believes in the sacredness of all life. He harms nothing, and he believes that he can live better, a better life spiritually, mentally, emotionally, in every other way, and in many cases, he does live a much better life healthily. On the other hand, I know many ethical vegetarians uh, who, uh, by the manner in which they live, uh, create disease in their bodies. It's not just a question of going without meat to get the benefits of vegetarianism, you must live a full vegetarian or natural hygienic life. Vegetarianism is a part of natural hygiene. It's a part of a way of life. And 
simply to be a vegetarian will not assure long life if you don't do a lot of other things. Fine, fine audience. It's coming Cinderella time. We have to close up shop. A final announcement. Please don't get up. A final announcement. Tomorrow morning, 9.30 till 11.30 a.m., right here in the West Ballroom, Jack Trop, Chairman, a natural food symposium, nutrition during infancy, youth, maturity. Shelton, Esser, Benish, Gaiman, Anderson, Jean Curcio. You'll never find another one like it. Be here. <laughs>